This is the respiratory system, which is chapter 22. The overall function of the respiratory system is to provide oxygen that's needed for cellular respiration, which in turn provides energy for the cell. That process of cellular respiration, a waste product, is carbon dioxide, CO2. And so the respiratory system also functions to get rid of that uh, carbon dioxide. If levels get too high, it does become toxic, so it has to be removed. It also plays a huge role in the acid-base balance and maintaining that balance. And so if you look at this um, picture here, <coughs> excuse me. You can see the respiratory system and the components of it, starting with uh, the nasal cavity, the nostrils and the nose as you breathe in the air. It's going to circulate around the nasal cavity, go down the pharynx to the trachea, which then branches to the left and right lung. Uh, once it branches, it's called the primary uh, bronchus or bronchi, plural. As I said, you've got the right lung over here and the left lung over here. Notice this little notch here. That's to provide space for the heart. And the lungs sit just right above the diaphragm. The conducting zone is involved with the um, getting the air basically into the lungs. So it's not involved with the direct gas exchange of oxygen and CO2. So it includes all those structures and organs um, that are helping to get the air in. It provides a, the airway, the route, to go from the nose down to the lungs. As the air is moving down, it's also um, contains debris, dust, pollen, it contains pathogens. And so there's means of like production of mucus and the hair and the cilia that are constantly working to remove and kind of filter that air as or prior to getting to the lungs. You don't want uh, the dust, you don't want the pollen and all that in the lungs itself. You obviously don't want pathogens because that would lead to a, a lung infection. Another thing that's going to happen in the conducting zone is, is that the incoming air is going to be warmed and it will be humidified, add moisture to it. So the conducting zone includes the nose, the nasal cavity, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, and the bronchial tree. The nose, <clears throat> we can get into a lot of detail. For this course, we're going to keep it relatively simple. You have the external nose. And that includes the nasal bones um, at the very top by the bridge of the bone, and then the cartilage. Most of the, what you see is the outer portion of the nose is the cartilage. The nasal cavity, that includes the conchae, which are going to um, help increase the surface area. They, they look more like ridges, if you will. Um, we studied these when we looked at the um, skeletal system. There is the inferior, middle, and superior conchi. It, it increases that surface area. It, and as it says, it disrupts the airflow. So the air, when you inhale it in the nasal cavity, it's actually going to swirl around in that nasal cavity. That is going to do a couple things. Number one, it gives a greater chance for it to um, activate or stimulate your olfactory nerves so that you're able to smell. But it also is going to help maximize the filtering, removing, as I said, some of that, that debris and warming the air up. The sinuses are going to play a role in helping to warm the air up as well as adding humidity to the air. Sinuses, remember, help um, to lighten the weight of the skull as well. And the mucus is going to play a role in helping to trap any de debris, as annoying as it may be for you. Uh, to have that mucus and congestion, it actually is a good thing. It's helping to filter and remove and prevent extra debris from getting down into the lungs themselves. Um, if you notice, I mentioned as the air is swirling around the nasal cavity, it gets warmed. Uh, this is important. It does help to humidify the air, uh, especially if you're in a very cold environment. You do not want to have that cold air 
going down to the lungs. You want to warm the air up before it goes down to the lungs. Um, if you've ever been in a very cold environment, um, it kind of catches your breath. It actually almost hurts um, if you're not able to warm that air up. And so in this picture is showing the external uh, portion of the nose. This area here is referred to as the bridge. And if you can see on this diagram, it shows quite well. Right here is the nasal bone. You can feel this if you palpitate on your, or you know, push on your nose. You can kind of feel where this ridge is, where the nasal bone ends to where the cartilage is. You do have this uh, septum in the middle. Uh, dividing into the right and the left side of the nose. So it's, it's right in here. Some people have a deviated septum, and that's what they're talking about. Is that it's instead of just being straight, it's, it's maybe off to one side. Um, I had a younger brother that had to have surgery for a deviated septum. He actually could not breathe through one side of his nose. And until it was discovered, he's like, well, I thought that was normal. I didn't know anybody was supposed to. Just kind of something to keep in mind that oftentimes what we consider, okay, that's not normal to the individual it is. That's all they've ever known. So for them, that is normal until someone tells them otherwise. You don't panic. You do not have to know all of these components here. I just felt that it was another very good picture of showing uh, here's the nostril, here's the nasal cavity. So here are the conchi that I was talking about. And you have the superior, middle, and inferior. So when you inhale, that air, instead of just going straight back, it swirls around in here. And that's how it's able to increase the chances of it getting filtered, the chances of it warming up, adding humidity to it. Up here is one of your sinuses, over here is the frontal sinus. So that air is swirling around, warming, adding moisture to it before it finally goes down and, and you're able to breathe. Another thing I want to point out at the very back right here, that is the opening for the estation tube. Just so you're aware that it does flow down into the nasal cavity. The pharynx is divided into three parts. You have the nasal pharynx, the ornopharynx, and the laryngeal pharynx. The nasal pharynx is the uppermost, most superior um, portion. It serves as an airway only. As I just said, the station tube is there. The uvula, that if you open your mouth wide and that little uh, cartilage thing you see hanging down, you always wondered what that was. That's the uvula. And what it does is whenever you swallow, it's going to push up and close off the nasal pharynx. So whatever you're eating or drinking, the idea is that it goes down and not back up into the nasal cavity. So it, uh, the idea is it's to protect the nasal cavity. The oral pharynx is the passageway for both food and air. So it's behind the oral cavity, behind your mouth, that it's uh, so the air coming from the nasal pharynx extends down there, but also your food. And the laryngeal pharynx is the most inferior portion of the pharynx. It is also a passageway for both food and air until it gets to the bottom, and then it's going to separate. That's where it's, you got a branch in the road, a fork in the road, and the back fork is going to go down the esophagus. That's where the food and drink's going to go, and the front fork is going to go down into the trachea. That's going to carry the air to the lungs. So this is showing the division. The, the nasal pharynx, remember, is attached to the back of the nasal cavity, so it only has air coming in. <clears throat> so right here would be the uvula. And so it's going to flip up, preventing food from going up into the nasal uh, cavity. The oropharynx and then down here the laryngeal. And then right here is your, your split, if you will, the fork in the road. So the front part right here, this is the trachea. So the air is going to go this way. You're going to have your voice box here, the larynx, and then the trachea. If you're eating or drinking, this right here is the epiglottis. When you swallow, that's going to come down, close off 
the larynx right here and allow the food and drink to go down the esophagus. So the esophagus is behind the larynx and the trachea. So the larynx connects the pharynx to the trachea. One thing it's going to do is help regulate the volume of air that is entering and leaving the lungs. As I just mentioned, the epiglottis is the cartilage that's going to cover the trachea. It's going to prevent uh, food or fluid from entering the trachea whenever you swallow. There are a couple different types of folds with the larynx. You have the vestibular folds, which are the false vocal cords, and then the true vocal cords. They will vibrate as the air is passing in and out to produce sound, and that's what allows you to talk. So the anterior view here of the larynx, there's the epiglottis up here, and so this is the larynx here. This prominence right here tends to be much larger in males than females. If you look at a lateral or side view of it, you can see here, um, this is the Adam's apple. That's what we commonly refer to it as. <coughs> um, so this is the larynx, and then down, right down here is where you start the trachea. Just so you know, if an individual, for whatever reasons, needs to have a tracheotomy done, where they put a tube in, uh, they insert, when it's done, you have to go below the larynx. So it's, it's called a tracheotomy because you are basically putting an artificial hole into the trachea to allow respiration to occur because you have the device here. Air is not going to be passing through the vocal cords, which as you can see here on this cross section, the true vocal cords are what is shown in white here. They will vibrate as the air is moving, as I said, in and out, as the air is passing through this, this opening. Um, if you have the tracheotomy down below the larynx, you don't have air passing through here, which means you're not able to speak. The trachea does connect the larynx to the lungs. It's able to expand and stretch during inhalation and uh, exhalation when you're breathing in and out. There are cartilage rings. They do provide support and they help prevent the trachea from collapsing. We do have a video. Uh, if you look on your supporting videos for the class of dissection that we did of a pluck. A pluck is the heart and lungs and trachea all still attached together and where we dissected those and you can see very easily the cartilage rings. We do point them out. So it's kind of neat to see. This is another viewpoint of the trachea, as you can see, the larynx here, and then the trachea is here, and right here, the carne is where you have the branch of the trachea. Now, you have what's known as your primary bronchi that are going to, one goes to the left lung, the other one goes to the right lung. And then once it enters the lung, it uh, starts further branching and becomes the secondary bronchi and just keeps branching like a tree, smaller and smaller branches as it extends um, and services the entire lung, both the left and the right. But you can see the, car the cartilage of the trachea, this rings as they wrap around giving that support. The bronchial tree, as I just said, the uh, carina is the site where that trachea branches. The primary bronchi are those first branches, if you will. They extend from the trachea to the lungs. Once in the lungs, you have extensive branching, and that's so you can get the maximum amount of air in and out of each lung. You're going to have mucous membranes that are producing mucus that help to trap debris, or try and prevent pathogens once again uh, from entering. So you have the primary bronchi, then it branches to the secondary bronchi, which then branches to the tertiary bronchi, which branch to the bronchiola. Each one is getting smaller and smaller in diameter, but more numerous too.
And this is just another picture showing. Once again, here's your trachea, the branch. Now it's showing on over here on the right lung. You have the primary, which branches to the secondary. And then you have the tertiary. And finally, have the little tiny bronchioles which then extend to the terminal bronchi, which are going to feed to the alveolar sacs, which is, we'll talk about in a bit, that's where the gas exchange actually occurs. So all of this is getting um, the air from outside to your lungs for the gas exchange to actually occur, bringing in oxygen, and then also for the CO2 to leave. The respiratory zone. You have the conducting zone, which was getting the air to the, the lungs. The respiratory zone is the area that's now directly involved with that gas exchange that must occur. And this is going to include the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, and the alveoli. So, <coughs> excuse me. This is a terminal uh, bronchiole, still part of the conducting zone. Here is the respiratory bronchial. So now it's even smaller diameter now to the alveolar duct, which is coming into each one of the, it looks like a, the alveolar sac. It, it looks like a, a bunch of grapes. And then each one of these, so the whole, the whole bunch is the alveolar sac. Each one of the individual grapes, if you will, is the alveoli. Alveolus is singular. Alveoli is plural. Now they have pores in them because they are connected. Or there is a passageway between them, which is the alveoli duct. And then you notice that they are surrounded by an extensive capillary system. So the alveolar duct connects that respiratory bronchial to the alveoli. The sac is the whole cluster and the alveolar are, in, are the individual sacs where the gas exchange is actually going to take place. So once again, here is the alveolar sac, the individual alveoli, and here you can see a little bit better the duct as it's coming through. See, there's an opening that's got to bring air in. But also notice here, because we're going to talk about this in a moment, for the gas exchange to occur, this alveolar sac is going to be basically like encapsulated with blood vessels, with the capillary bed. Now in the alveoli, there's different types of cells. There's what we call type 1 alveolar cell, which is very permeable to gases. So it's that's we're going to allow the exchange to occur. The gas can pass through it. Type 2 alveolar cells secrete the pulmonary surfactant. That's going to help keep the um, alveoli from collapsing, which in turn ultimately helps keep the lung from collapsing. And then you've got the alveolar macrophages. These are phagocytic cells. You are inhaling your obviously bringing air in from the outside. This may have bacteria in it, may have viruses in it, may have fungi in it, um, may have pollen and, and all this foreign debris, foreign substances. You want to prevent infection. You want to prevent them from being able to penetrate uh, even further into the body to get out of the lungs and say get into the bloodstream, which then it can go anywhere in the body. And so you want to have a fairly high concentration of phagocytic cells as compared to other places that are more internal in the body that don't, when I say internal, I mean don't have an opening to the outside. Yes, I know your lungs are inside the thoracic cavity, but they have that opening to the outside because of the air passageways of the conducting zone. So you want to make sure that you have protection so you do have a, a concentration of phagocytic cells that will recognize anything foreign and immediately engulf and destroy it. And so once again, you've got your alveoli sac. Here's your uh, pulmonary capillaries surrounding them. In the cross section of one of these, this is just showing the different types of cells. So you have the alveoli, so the gas permeable ones here, the type 1. You have the type 2 that is secreting surfactant, keeping this 
inflated, if you will, keeping it from collapsing and sticking to the sides, sticking to each other. And then the macrophages here. And this is kind of a cool cross section where, remember, lumen is the opening. So this is the opening of the bronchiole. Now, as you're moving into the alveoli duct, and you've got all these separate little alveoli in here that are the openings. So the lungs themselves are enclosed by pleural, the uh, connected uh, tissue membranes. The left lung, in terms of volume, is slightly smaller than the right lung. The left lung has that cardiac notch, that little indentation. That's for the because of the heart. We have to leave room for the heart. Now, the lungs, when we talk about the apex of the lung, we're talking about the superior, the uppermost region. And the base is the inferior region that's right near the diaphragm. The right lung has three lobes. The left lung has only two lobes. Each lobe then is divided into bronchial pulmonary segments. Each lobe has its um, own blood supply. So if there is a disease or abnormality that is affecting only one lobe or maybe only one segment within one lobe, it is relatively speaking, relatively easy to isolate that segment and remove that without having to completely reroute all kinds of blood vessels and nerve vessels. They tend to, the way the, the blood vessels come in and then separate each segment is, um, which is in each lobe, has its own kind of separate segment of blood supply. So this is showing with the right lung, the superior lobe, the middle lobe, inferior lobe, and then on the left you just have the superior and the inferior lobe. Once again showing the branching pattern, why we call it the bronchial tree. In terms of blood supply to the lungs, the pulmonary trunk uh, branches coming, you know, from the uh, right ventricle. The pulmonary trunk is going to branch to the pulmonary arteries. Uh, pulmonary arteries continue branching. Now they tend to follow the bronchi. One arteriole and one venule will supply and drain uh, one pulmonary lobule. The capillaries encase the alveoli, like we've seen in some of the previous pictures. The helium is the site where the pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins, the bronchi, nerves, where everything kind of enters and leaves the, the lungs. So this is showing, um, may look a little bit confusing, but your lungs here, the heart diagram here. So you've got your pulmonary trunk, this said coming from the right ventricle, pulmonary trunk branches. Here it goes to the left pulmonary arteries, which obviously are feeding the left lung. The right pulmonary arteries come this way, go behind the superior vena cava, and they will enter. So the helium is in this region right here, and then this region right here. So the pulmonary artery, once it enters the right lung, it immediately starts to branch. And see, this is going to be feeding the superior uh, lobe, middle lobe, and this one comes down here to the inferior lobe. Over here on the left lung, you've got the superior lobe, and then down here to the inferior lobe. And then the red which is now oxygenated because you've had the exchange occur in the pulmonary arteries, is bringing that oxygenated blood via the pulmonary veins back to the left atrium right here. And just once again, here with the capillaries, as you see it, encompassing, encasing that alveoli uh, sac. In terms of the nervous system and how it's innervating the lungs, the parasympathetic uh, division, remember that, the relaxation, that causes bronchial constriction. You don't need quite as much air 
Obviously, you need air, but not quite as much. You're just rest and relaxation. The sympathetic uh, system, when it gets activated, it causes bronchial dilation because you're going to increase the respiration rate. You need to get more oxygen in. You need to get that CO2 out. And so the bronchioles will dilate, increasing that diameter to increase the airflow. The pleural of the lungs, the pleural remember is that serous membranes type of connective tissue surrounding each lung. It produces a fluid. The fluid is helping to lubricate surfaces and reduce friction. The pleural cavity is the space between the two pleural layers because you, you have two layers. You have the visceral pleural, which is the innermost layer. It's right next to the lung. And then the parietal layer is the outermost layer. It's connected to the thoracic wall depending on where it is on the lung, the mediastinum, or the diaphragm. And so the space between them is where the uh, pleural fluid is going to be. Pleurisy is when you have an inflammation of the pleural membranes. And because it's right attached to the lungs, yeah, it's going to be painful every time you inhale and exhale. And so this is showing excuse me, um, you can see here with the lung, so here's the lung if we look at a cross section of it, and right here is the visceral pleural, right here the outermost one is the parietal pleural right next to the thoracic wall in this case, and the space in the middle is that pleural cavity, and that's where the fluid is to reduce the friction and help lubricate. The actual act of breathing is known as pulmonary ventilation. It's going to be dependent on several different things. It's going to be dependent upon the atmospheric pressure. That's the pressure that the air has outside of the body. It's also going to be dependent upon intra-alveoli pressure. What is the pressure in the alveoli? What's the pressure in the lungs? And then the intrapleural pressure, that's the pressure that's in the pleural cavity. That's going to be involved mostly with helping to keep the lungs inflated. So a few things to keep in mind when we talk about this pressure, and some of you might be thinking, oh, I'm not taking physics, I'm not taking physics, oh no, and chemistry, and oh, I thought I was done with this. Or, well, here we go. You start to learn when you study biology, it does involve chemistry, it does involve physics. Everything's interrelated. So just very simply, with pressure, as you increase the volume, if you're talking about a closed um, system, if you increase that volume, the pressure is going to decrease. As the volume decreases, the pressure is going to increase. So it's inverse. And gas will move from high pressure to low pressure, just like we've seen with liquid goes from high concentration to low concentration. Same thing happens with gas. It's going to go from high pressure to low pressure. You will see sometimes as you're reading or if you hear people talking about a negative pressure versus a positive pressure. They relate everything to atmospheric pressure. So if something has a negative pressure, that means it's less pressure than what the atmospheric pressure is. And if it has a positive pressure, that means it's greater than what the atmospheric pressure is. So am I going to require that you know the numbers? No. It might help you to kind of understand a few things when it's giving you some of these numbers in terms of intrapleural pressure uh, versus intra-avialar pressure, um, atmospheric pressure, you're going to be looking, like I say, intrapleural pressure is going to help keep the lungs inflated, keep them from collapsing, but we're also going to, atmospheric pressure relative to the intra-avialar pressure is going to determine whether you are inhaling or exhaling. So what are some of the physical factors that will affect ventilation, which remember is breathing? Well, one thing that's going to affect it is contraction and relaxation of your diaphragm and the external intercoastal muscles. The size of the airways, pulmonary surfactant, which hopefully is there, and the expansion of your thoracic cavity. 
So inspiration, that's when you inhale, air is flowing into the lungs. What happens with inspiration is that the diaphragm and your external intercostal muscles contract. When they contract, what happens is the thoracic cavity volume is going to increase. So what do we just say? If we increase the volume, it's inverse to pressure. So the pressure decreases. Now, atmospheric pressure, has it changed? No. It stayed the same. So what happens when the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles contract, they increase the volume of the thoracic cavity, which decreases the pressure. Now the interavioli pressure, think of it as the pressure inside the lungs is less than the atmospheric pressure. So if gas goes from high pressure to low pressure, where is the gas going to go? It's going to go from outside, from the atmosphere, into the lungs because it goes from high pressure to low pressure. And that's how you're inhaling. Now to exhale, expiration. It's a uh, what we call a passive process because there's no energy required. In this case, the air is going to you're exhaling, air is flowing out of the lungs. Why does this happen? Well, during expiration, the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles, they relax. When they relax, that thoracic cavity volume decreases. If volume decreases, that means the pressure in the lungs increase. So the lungs, they're going to decrease the size of the the lungs, the intraavioli pressure increases, and so what happens now? The intraavioli pressure is greater than the atmospheric pressure. Those lungs are going to decrease in size. You have increased pressure now inside the lungs, lower pressure outside, so you exhale. And this diagram this might help make a little more sense to visually see. Inspiration, so you're inhaling. What's happening? Intercostal muscles contract. Diaphragm contracts. So as it contracts, it's going to actually move down. And what happens now, you are increasing the volume of the thoracic cavity here. Decreasing pressure, so air flows in. When you go to exhale, when you when you inhale the thoracic um, cage, the ribs, and the, they tend to kind of move up and out. Now, look what happens here when you exhale, and the muscle, the intercostal muscles contract, so the rib cage kind of comes down a bit. But the diaphragm, look as the diaphragm when it's relaxed. It's dome shaped. When it contracts, it flattens out. So when it relaxes and it becomes more dome shaped again, look at the, the volume of the thoracic cavity versus over here. It's much smaller, which means the pressure increased. Now the air is going to flow out. And look at the lungs. See how the lungs themselves, so the lungs decrease in size. So, of course, we're going to categorize different types of breathing. Uh, very quiet, normal breathing is uh, eupnea. Diaphragmatic breathing is very taking in a very deep breath. Coastal breathing is very shallow breath. And hibernating is forced breathing, such as when you're exercising or singing, where you require additional muscles to help with the inhalation and exhalation. When you're talking about the process of breathing, we often look at the volume of air, and there's different types of respiratory volumes and also respiratory capacities. So if we look at the respiratory volumes, you can use a spirometer and you can actually measure this. Tidal volume, that is the amount of air that's inhaled during just regular quiet breathing. Roughly on average for most people, about 500 milliliters. Now, this might vary depending on if you're an athlete or not, do you have some type of a respiratory uh, disorder like asthma? That, that's going to affect those numbers, but on average it's about 500 mils. 
The ERV, which is the expiratory reserve volume, is the amount of air that's forcefully exhaled. So you exhale, and then you exhale as much as you can, forcefully. And that's roughly 1,200 mils. Inspiratory reserve volume, this is the amount of air that you forcefully inhale above the tidal volume. So if you inhale, and then you take another, without exhaling, take another deep, deep breath up. How much can you forcefully inhale? Residual volume, or RV, is the amount of lungs that remains, amount of air that remains in your lungs after forcefully exhaling. So even if you forcefully exhale, there is still always going to be some air left in the lungs because you do not want those alveoli uh, to collapse. So there's always some air that's going to be left in the alveoli that's known as your residual volume. When you talk about the capacities, total lung capacity, this is the sum of all the various lung volumes. So what are all those different lung volumes? Well, vital capacity, that's the amount of air moving in and out of the lungs. It does not include that residual volume because residual volume doesn't move. Remember, it's the amount remaining. The inspiratory capacity is the maximum amount of air that you can inhale. Functional residual capacity is the amount of air remaining in the lungs after a normal tidal uh, expiration. So someone that's a, a respiratory therapist, they're going to measure these different volumes with a patient, gives them a little bit of a clue as to basically the health of the lungs. So here's the tidal volume, just that normal amount. Inspiratory reserve volume, when you forcefully inhale, forcefully exhale. And remember that residual volume is what always remains in the lungs. And so they're you can measure these volumes, determine the capacity. And once again, the total lung capacity, all of these numbers, this, where all this is added together, it, it gives you an idea of the overall health of the lungs and what's going on. The respiratory rate, this is the number of breaths per minute. It's going to be controlled usually by the uh, respiratory center of the medulla oblongata. It does respond to different uh, changes of concentrations of things. Concentration of carbon dioxide, concentration of oxygen, the pH in the blood. All of these changes in concentrations can have an effect. Now, the main stimulus, and a lot of people don't realize this, the main stimulus for you basically to inhale is not oxygen. It is the concentration of carbon dioxide. And a lot of people don't realize that, but it, it, it's actually the carbon dioxide is the main stimulus when it starts to get too high because it does, at high levels basically, it is uh, toxic. Uh, if any of you have ever watched Apollo 13, that was the whole problem where they had, you know, Houston, we have a problem uh, with the apparatus that was supposed to scrub or remove the CO2 from the air in the spacecraft malfunction. And so the levels of CO2 were increasing. Uh, what is that going to do? It's going to, tr if levels of CO2 become too high. Yes, it's going to trigger your respiration rate to increase um, because you, you've got to remove that CO2 from your blood. Um, it does become toxic. What will happen if it's not removed? Uh, eventually, you're going to get disoriented, um, kind of confused. Eventually, you get tired, go to sleep, and you're just not going to wake up. Under normal conditions, the respiratory rate is a very consistent, rhythmic, uh, rate, things that will increase the rate are things like pain, increased temperature, and then the sympathetic nervous division will increase the rate when you're under that fight or flight stress. So ventilation, as we've said before, that's breathing, that's movement of air in and out of the lungs. Perfusion is the blood flow in the pulmonary cap capillaries. So ventilation and perfusion need to be balanced. The oxygen 
is going to be entering the alveoli. Every time you inhale, it enters the alveoli at a high rate. The partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli is high, but the partial pressure of oxygen in the capillaries is low. And remember, things go from high to low. So oxygen is going to just naturally diffuse into the blood because it's going to wear this lower pressure. Blood flow to the pulmonary capillaries is going to be very closely regulated because you want to maximize the amount of gas exchange that's going on. If there is an alveoli that is not functioning properly, maybe it's blocked, uh, for, you know, filled with mucus, whatever, the blood flow is going to decrease to that particular alveoli, not stop completely because then the cells will die, but it is going to decrease. Get the blood going to areas where you can have that proper gas exchange occur. Now the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is higher in the blood in the alveoli uh, than in the alveoli. So once again, carbon dioxide is going to follow that concentration gradient, that pressure gradient. And so if it's high in the blood and the pressure is low in the alveoli for carbon dioxide, then the carbon dioxide flows out of the blood and into the alveoli. So then you can exhale it. So oxygen and carbon dioxide are going in opposite directions. External respiration refers to the gas exchange that occurs in the alveoli. Internal respiration refers to the gas exchange that's occurring in the tissues. So the gas exchange is due to diffusion. No energy is required, as we just saw. In the alveoli, it follows the pressure gradients. And so it's the pressure gradient basically is going to be opposite in the tissue so that the oxygen is going to flow out of the blood into the tissues and the carbon dioxide is flowing from the tissues into the blood. So how is oxygen going to be carried? It's going to bind to the hemoglobin. For external respiration, <coughs> excuse me, in the alveoli, this picture is just showing that you've got the oxygen, which has a higher pressure in the alveoli, is going to be flowing into, this would be the capillary over here, it is going to be flowing into the blood vessel, into that capillary. Some of the oxygen will be dissolved in plasma. The majority of it will bind to the hemoglobin that's in the red blood cell. CO2, some of the CO2 is dissolved in the plasma, so it's going to flow out from the blood into the alveoli, because remember this is external, so it's at the alveoli. Uh, some of it is bound to the hemoglobin in what we call carbon amino hemoglobin, and it will detach and flow into the alveoli. The majority of the carbon dioxide in the blood is going to be carried in the form of bicarbonate. This right here is bicarbonate. This is just carbonic acid. This is carbonate. And so uh, that's the way most of the CO2 is carried. Most of the oxygen will be carried on the hemoglobin. And then the internal respiration. So here's your tissue cells. They're releasing CO2 as waste product. Now it's being released out of the cell into the interstitial fluid where it's really high concentration, so higher pressure. And this is once again the capillary. So it's going to flow into the capillary. High concentration, low concentration, high pressure, low pressure. The CO2 is low here, so it's going to detach from the hemoglobin and move across into the interstitial fluid taken up by then the cells. So most of the oxygen is transported, as I just said, uh, bound to the hemoglobin in the blood. Each hemoglobin can bind four oxygen molecules. As the oxygen partial pressure starts to increase, it will actually increase the binding of oxygen. And so that occurs in the lungs. As the partial pressure decreases for oxygen, 
it decreases the binding of oxygen to the hemoglobin. And that's what happens in the tissue. So as that pressure decreases, it starts releasing the oxygen off the hemoglobin. Higher temperature increases oxygen dissociation from hemoglobin, releasing it. Lower temperature decreases, so more of the oxygen remains bound to the hemoglobin at low temperature. pH is going to have a role too. Lower pH, so an acidic pH, is going to promote oxygen dissociation, oxygen coming off of the hemoglobin. A higher pH, the oxygen is going to remain remain bound to the hemoglobin. It's the hemoglobin has four subunits. It has the heme group, which has iron in it. So each one of these can bind an oxygen. For carbon dioxide, uh, there's three ways that it's transported. As I said just a little bit ago, it can be dissolved in the plasma. It can be uh, transported as bicarbonate. As I said, that is the way the majority of the CO2 is transported. What happens is that carbon dioxide and water, they form carbonic acid. Then carbonic acid dissociates into the bicarbonate ion and hydrogen ion. And this is very important to remember a little bit later when we talk about acid-base balances in another chapter, is that when you have CO2, if you increase the amount of CO2 in the blood, because the majority of it is transported as bicarbonate ion, with that means you're going to have an increase of hydrogen ions. When you have an increase of hydrogen ions, what does that do? That's acid. That's going to lower your pH. So your pH is going to start to drop. If it drops too much, remember, the blood pH is constantly being monitored. So if you're going into this, what we call acidosis, you're producing a higher amount of acid, those hydrogen ions. How is the body going to respond to that? Well, if it's what we call respiratory acidosis, the way to correct this you have to get rid of those hydrogen ions because you've got to bring that pH back up. How are you going to do that? Take the hydrogen ions. This reaction is reversible, which means it most ultimately had to do with the carbon dioxide. Get rid of the carbon dioxide. How are you going to get rid of the carbon dioxide? Increase your respiration rate so you can exhale it. Because the hydrogen ions will bind with the bicarbonate forming carbonic acid, which then is going to, this reaction as I said is reversible, then divide into the carbon dioxide and water. And so you're going to release that carbon dioxide, and then you're going to bring that pH back up to the normal range. So one of the reasons for monitoring carbon dioxide and having that as a stimulus for your breathing rate, your respi respiration rate, is going to be tied into the hydrogen ions, which is tied into the pH. Start seeing how everything's interrelated now. You cannot have that pH drop too low. So how do you prevent it from dropping too low besides having buffering systems, which, as I said, we'll get into this when we talk about acid-base balance. But it's also monitor that CO2. Some of the CO2 is also bound to the hemoglobin. Uh, now, it's going to be dependent on the partial pressure of the carbon dioxide, as we've seen. <coughs> if the heme is bound has oxygen bound to it, then it will not bind carbon dioxide. It has a greater affinity for oxygen. So transporting, once again, of the carbon dioxide, uh, some of it, once again, is dissolved. Some of it will be bound to the uh, hemoglobin. But this reaction, once again, is showing carbon Dioxide comes in, binds with water, forming carbonic acid right here. H2CO3 is carbonic acid, but it then dissociates into the bicarbonate ion, which is HCO3, 
and releases a hydrogen ion right here. So what are some of the modifications? Uh, respiratory functions, well, we've talked about hypermia, which is forced breathing. We increase it. Hyperventilation, this is where you increase the ventilation rate. You're going to result in lower CO2 levels because you're breathing faster. You're getting rid of all that CO2. If you have lower CO2 levels, like we were just saying, what does that do? That's going to increase the blood pH. Now, there's also something that we see with higher altitude. There's a decreased atmospheric pressure. And if inhaling and exhaling has to do with the pressure inside the alveoli, inside the lungs, versus atmospheric pressure, well, if you decrease atmospheric pressure, is that going to have an effect? Yes, it will. And what we do see uh, above certain altitudes is altitude sickness. Uh, this results with lower oxygen levels in the blood. What are the symptoms? You have nausea, vomiting, fatigue, lightheadedness, drowsiness. Uh, how can you prevent from getting altitude sickness? If you slowly increase the altitude, uh, some people have this, um, are more affected by others. Uh, years ago, my mother had some heart issues and asthma. We found when she went from Louisiana sea level up to Colorado to visit my sister, that if she flew, because it was just a sudden change in the altitude, it was much harder on her. It was easier for her to drive. And that way she slowly was adjusting to a slowly increase in the altitude. Uh, so sometimes you can prevent getting altitude sickness if you just ascend slowly. Um, that allows the body to acclimate to the change in, in altitude. People who do live at a higher altitude um, tend, one well, of the ways the body will adjust naturally is going to increase the production of the erythrocytes because that's where the hemoglobin is and that allows you to buy more oxygen then. And so that's one, one way of um, the body has of acclimating to. Uh, when I lived for many years in New Mexico near Albuquerque, a lot of people don't realize how high elevation Albuquerque is. Albuquerque is a mile high. And the weather is uh, year round pretty good. Uh, over 200 days of sunshine. It can get cold. It can obviously get really hot too. But overall, one thing I was surprised when I moved there, the number of athletes, runners, uh, bicyclists, etc., who actually live there and train because it is a higher altitude um, and the weather's nice. They can still do their outside exercising and then if they go to compete down at lower altitudes, they have more uh, red blood cells. So they actually have a higher oxygen capacity. And this just shows uh, the altitude. So like New York is uh, at sea level. Uh, places like around Houston, around uh, Louisiana. New Orleans is actually below in the city. Uh, New Orleans is actually below sea level. Uh, you go to some place like Boulder, which is 5,000 feet. Aspen, Colorado, which is 8,000. Santa Fe, New Mexico is 7,000 feet. But notice how the atmospheric uh, pressure changes. It's decreasing as you go up. And so this will have an effect on your ability uh, to breathe. So anyone who tries to climb Mount Everest, um, you don't just, you know, get there and immediately start up. You have to kind of go in stages to get acclimated to uh, the climate, to get acclimated to the altitude and that lower pressure. And you're going to be moving slower. In terms of embryonic development, the mother is going to provide the oxygen and remove the carbon dioxide for the developing fetus. Respiratory development begins between weeks four and seven. 
between week 7 and 16, you have the development continuing of all the airways. By the end of about week 16, all of the major lung structures have been formed. Between weeks 16 and 24, you have development of the pulmonary blood vessels. You have secretions of the pulmonary surfactant starting. You do have some of these, uh, what they refer to as fetal breathing movements, beginning. Now, they're not breathing as far as providing oxygen, but you, you get that muscle movement starting. Weeks 24 to term growth and maturation of the respiratory system, and you have increased surfactant production the hazard part. And this is just showing uh, from beginning of week uh, four. As you can see, you're starting to see the development of the larynx. You've got the pharynx here. And what they refer to as the budding, you're forming all of those airways. And by eight weeks, you have the, the basic structures of the lungs with all the airways present. Fetal breathing starts around 20 to 21 weeks. It is a sign of very good health in the developing fetus. It doesn't occur on a continuous basis. It kind of comes and goes. They don't completely understand it. What we feel is it's helping to tone those muscles, preparing for breathing, which obviously has to start at birth. Uh, what are they breathing in and out? It's the amniotic fluid. And then at birth, the birthing process itself is going to expel most of the fluid out of the lungs, that amniotic fluid, the mucus, some of the surfactant. Any of the remaining fluid gets absorbed. Um, that first breath, that first inhalation, is going to inflate the lungs. Um, respiratory distress syndrome, this is uh, when usually there's insufficient production of the surfactant. If there's not enough surfactant, the lungs are not fully inflating. Um, this is an increased risk of with preemies, especially before week 28. Um, how can they treat this? There's several different things that they can do. Add surfactant. You know, usually they have to add oxygen, adjusting the pressure. So that basically, depending on how severe it is, they may have to put the infant on a ventilator. Uh, but there are different ways that they can, can deal with that.